Morning. I think we'll get started. We're at two minutes past eight. So good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know me, I'm uh, Tony Young. I am a urologist down in South End on Sea in Essex. Um, in, uh, I discovered, actually, when I started there, it was one of the first uh, urology units set up by Andy Ball outside a major city in the UK. So they've got a great history down there. I've really enjoyed being there as a consultant for the last 12 years. And then around 10 years ago, I became the chair and director of medical innovation at Anglia Ruskin <coughs> University. And then five years ago, got appointed by Sir Bruce Keogh as the first ever national clinical director, now called the national clinical lead for innovation, originally appointed at NHS England. But as you can see the slide, NHS England and NHS Improvement are essentially operating as one organization. So I work at both of those uh, institutions now. And then most recently, I've taken on the role of Associate Medical Director for my STP. So these are likely to be the footprints that our accountable care systems really start growing into with a remit around innovation and transformation. And we might cover some of that. So in the next sort of session, I'm going to give you a background to some of the things. I came and spoke last year. And we had the Chief Medical Officer of Qualcomm Life come and talk about the state side view as what was going on with innovation and data and, anal and analytics. And what I thought we'd do this time is uh, give you an update on what's happened. Quite a lot has happened in the last year, uh, particularly around policy and the government and what they're doing and programs. Um, and then we're very fortunate to have my colleague here, Patrick Mitchell, from Health Education England. He's one of their exec directors with a responsibility for innovation and transformation. So I think you're going to get to hear what's next, what's coming in what is, has now been identified as the number one issue facing the NHS, which is workforce. How are we going to build a sustainable workforce for the future that can do all the latest, greatest things? And then rather than have more slides, I thought what we would do, or have some nice videos, we'd actually have some of our real innovators on some of the programs I run, the Clinical Entrepreneur Program, and they're going to come up and tell you a little bit about their journey. We've given them four minutes each just to come and tell you who they are, what they're doing, why they're passionate about it, and see if there are some connections. I think all of them have a urology theme running through them in, in one way or another. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and I think uh, you'll find them quite inspiring. I do. So let's get going. So. A number of things have happened across government in the year since I was last here. So the um, life science industrial strategy that Sir John Bell from Oxford um, has led and championed, they have uh, now produced their sector deal, which is how we can work with the life sciences sector, how government can work with them, how the NHS can work with them. And then in January this year, the long-term plan for the NHS came out which is, uh, sets a, a vision for the next, we didn't define it, but five, ten years, maybe longer, of the kind of things we need to see and do. And that's actually been welcomed right across the system as saying the right kind of things that we need to do and move forward. And then uh, around about the same time, I think it might have been just before Christmas, the Secretary of State came out with his tech vision um, uh, I know where it is, it's buried on the Department of Health website. It's well worth a look of where our current Secretary of State thinks we need to go and we've got a really tech-savvy, enthusiastic Secretary of State at the moment who wants to drive that forward. So I thought I'd show you the infrastructure that's been put in place to make us a nation that helps deliver on innovation for our population and our healthcare system. So. It's now been called the Accelerated Access Collaborative. So this is chaired by Lord Darcy at Imperial College London. The Secretary of State is on the board of this and various others. So this is a senior steering group with industry, government, professional representation that sit together and look at how we as a health system can take up the latest, greatest things, bring professionals with us, have the right level of evidence and take those all forward. And there are four key areas, as you can see, they want us to work on. Looking at how we improve our research and horizon scanning, and we've put a number of things in place looking at that. Smarter, more joined up investments, and I'm going to talk about some of those and some of the things NHS England are doing in that space in particular. We want to make it more simple to get those ideas out of the lab, out of 
you know, our minds and into the hospitals, into the clinics, making a difference to patients. And we've got some proposals around that as well. But we also want patients to be given access to faster, innovative treatments. And you'll see, as I go through some of the examples here, and there are some very specific ones. We've had two in particular in urology, the Eurolift device and the Spaceor device, both of which are here in the conference today. And they are being supported centrally to be taken up. And we'll go through that a little bit. So this high-level group, chaired by Lord Darcy, sits at the top of that. But that consists of a whole load of partners, the ABHI, NHS, MHRA, patient voices are there, nice. You can see the groups in the top of that slide. So it's a really high-level group of um, system thinkers and experts from across various organizations. And then we have my direct line boss, the chief executive of the Accelerated Access Collaborative. So these are the team that actually do the work that sit underneath those. So Sam Roberts is my director. So she's in the middle of the slide there. And I sit alongside Sam as her lead clinical advisor around innovation uh, in this space. So you may have heard of NHSX, which the Secretary of State announced uh, last year and is just coming into place now and being set up with its own chief executive because I think um, uh, uh, the story Matt Hancock gave was he wanted an answer about why you couldn't get access to data from different bits of the system on a particular query, he had and bring it all together. And it took him six weeks to get the answer when he first started and he just said it's not good enough. <clears throat> so he founded the view for uh, the vision for NHSX, bringing all the digital services into a, a place in the centre. This one's located in the Department of Health and Social Care. But the innovation unit, as it's going to become known, is actually going to be based in NHS England. But it will still reach out into all those arm's length bodies. And Sam has the difficult job of not only reporting to the Secretary of State and the Accelerated Access Collaborative Board, but also to NHS England and NHS Improvement. So lots of people coming down and looking at the work we're doing and holding, to us, uh, holding us directly to account for that. And then there's a whole team of us beneath that as well that support this activity, the Innovation and Research Life Science Unit at NHS England. We've got a Commercial Medicines Unit, a Medicines Policy Unit, our Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, because lots of the things that are coming forward, of course, are drugs and genomics, but there are devices and things too. So there are six key priority areas that we've identified that we want to take forward from having a single door. Where do you go? You have got a great idea and you want to get it taken forward. Who do you go and see? Well, I always say the front door for clinicians in the NHS or your academic health science networks, but actually in the system more widely, it's going to be the accelerated access collaborative and the innovation unit that sit within that. And we will also look at the signals coming from the system, the demands we want to hear from clinicians, we want to hear from the front line on what the new latest greatest things are, what the pressures, what the issues are, and how we might deal with them. And at the moment, there are several different ways that we look into the future at what might be coming. It's not just the academic literature, and the NIHR have a brilliant horizon scanning unit at the University of Newcastle, but it's also looking at what's coming out of the commercial world, looking at the funding scene. Typically five years before it hits the medical journals, startups are getting funded and developing their products and services, and we need to know about those when that's happening so we can be ahead of the game in our approvals and things. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the testing infrastructure. So Simon Stevens, my chief executive, set out a very bold vision for this just a few weeks ago. He said on artificial intelligence, we're going to be hearing some examples of that later. And what he said was, we want the NHS within five years to be the world's leading place for testing, trialing, and adopting proven and cost-effective AI in the health service. We want the world to come and look at that, us and do that. And we've got some key examples. If you've seen the work going on at Moorfields with DeepMind, with their 3D retinal scans, many more things. It's not just radiology, it's pathology. There are clinical pathways as well. You may be familiar with the streams thing that uh, uh, was bought from Aradaz's unit um, by DeepMind a few years ago now and what they're taking forward there. But we also want to put support adoption and spread. Great ideas are great, but unless they're taken up across the system, it's a real problem, isn't it? And you're going to see some of the ways in which we're doing that. And then 
how are we, um, how are we going to fund that? Because it's all very well saying we've got this nice mechanism for taking things up, but if we're not paying for that, so you will have seen, if you, if, uh, you uh, uh, look through the NHS England uh, website and our announcements, but other press releases and things we put out, we're putting our money where our mouth is and we are commissioning some of these things nationally and taking them forward. And it's all for this. It's not just for the benefits of patients and service users, which are really fundamental. They're at the heart of what we do. But it's got to be for professionals. But for businesses, small, medium, large, and the life science sector, we need to grow our economy. We have one of the leading life science sectors on the planet. I think we have over 11,000, I think, at the last count, companies in this space. And when you look at other countries like Spain, when I was there recently, they just have 500 life science companies. Most of them are distributors. So we have a really great kind of unfair advantage in that space here. So we support things across a whole range of different areas. And this takes you from the idea and proof of concept adoption and spread. So our academic health science networks, 15 of them funded across the country. I think they get about 54 million pounds a year from the center to help be that place to go to, not just with your idea, how can you help me get it taken up and taken forward, but how can we test it, trial it, how can we adopt it, and how can we scale it right across the system? with our Small Business Research Initiative, which gives um, phase one and phase two grants, about 100,000 pound phase one, a million pounds or so. And we've had several of the entrepreneurs on the program I run taking that forward. Our National Innovation Accelerator, and you're going to hear a little bit about that, I think, later. One of our pitches has been on that program. So this is for ideas that are proven to say, how can we now scale this across the system? Our innovative technology payment system. So that's where NHS England each year, look, we get submissions from industry and they come along to us and say, the system aren't taking this up. How can you fund this centrally? So we put our hands in our pockets and we fund it if it's got the right evidence, if we've got the right support from clinical and professional groups, and if it's going to improve quality of care and cost effectiveness. So they go through quite a process and we'll look at some of those things that have gone on that. Um, the Office for Life Science, working in partnership with NHS England, have developed this test bed. So actually, when it's not got that level of evidence, but you want to test it and trial it at scale in a real-world setting, we can do that for you. And then the program I run, the Entrepreneur Program. So before, we had never supported entrepreneurs in the NHS. We'd never given them that opportunity. But now we have over 340 of them, and come September, we'll be up to over 500. So very quickly, I'm going to take, these are their metrics from year two. So we had over 242 clinicians at the end of year two. They created 113 startups between them. They'd raised 118 million pounds. Incredible what you can do if you give frontline clinicians the permission. But most importantly, 81 of them who'd left healthcare or were about to quit the health service came back to work in the NHS or stayed as a result of this entrepreneur program. So you're going to meet some of them later, but I'm just going to give you one quick example because I really like this. It's not a urology example. Really common problem. It might look like a chicken McNugget, but it's actually earwax. This half a billion people across the planet have this. It causes falls, makes dementia worse, hearing loss, a whole range of things. So one of our young entrepreneurs, this is his, he came up with this great idea. We're, we've always been great inventors in Britain, haven't we? This is the production line up there. And it's the community ear examination kit, a little speculum, a, a little holder that holds your smartphone, and a little speculum that can look in your ear, and you can see his first production line. He was so happy when he sent me that photo. And here you have a care assistant in Boots. Boots have now rolled this out nationally across all their hearing aid centers. It's been rolled out globally with the Walgreens Alliance as well. So what Chris Ramdu says is this is so easy to use, this device. You can train anyone to use it. It's that simple. And I've had a haircut since I had that, and I can say my ears are fine despite the Secretary of State looking in them. But what power to have your health minister looking at a frontline clinician startup idea. So Chris was an ENT surgeon that had to leave to pursue his innovation. He's come back as a GP trainee in Northwest London. So we've kept that clinical talent in the NHS. So these are some of the ideas that, and some of the things we've been supporting. You can see Eurolift there, which we, pushed through the system so it could go on the coding system for hospitals so you could do that, but a range of other things from different scissors and catheters and apps and platforms. 
And then various other things. Here we have at the top there the little endocuff vision. That's gone down really well. This little thing, it's like a sponge thing that you put on the end of the colonoscope, and it just opens up the bowel. But because it costs a few pounds, units weren't using it. And we know it allows you to complete colonoscopy more effectively. So we're paying for it in the center. And now, I think we're up to 80,000 odd uses. We'll see at the end. But the one I really like, I went on Breakfast TV about a month ago to talk about space or. So when these all came through for assessment, I was sitting there at the committee that makes the decisions about looking at the evidence for these things. And space all came through. And I just said, this is a no brainer. I know the evidence is early, but the principle of lifting an organ out of a radiation field has got to be right. We should at least test and trial it. So I think there are now 12 or 13 centers across the country that have been funded to allow us to gain the evidence to show that this is really working. So we are putting our money where our mouth is and do some of these things. And these are some of the metrics. Um, so endocuff vision already, 39,000. And the non-injectable arterial connector, you, so you can only inject one way into an arterial line because people sometimes are having drugs administered in them. It's 87,000 of those. So we are starting to do things to make a change, to make a difference, to take that forward. But it's all very well, these innovations, and you've seen some very practical ones here, but there are lots of digital ones, lots of ones related to artificial intelligence and, and, and new forms of technology. And how are we equipping our workforce with the skills, the knowledge, and the experience to be able to deal with what's coming. And that, what I'm delighted to say, is what our next speaker, Patrick Mitchell from Health Education England, is going to address. Patrick. Good morning, everybody, and great to be here. Um, I have to say I'm a bit more of a night bird than a morning person, so I knew career-wise I could never be a surgeon, and I'm very impressed that uh, uh, so many of you can be here at uh, 8 o'clock at the, the start of a conference, so, uh, so welcome. Um, I'm from Health Education England. Um, we're a five uh, billion pound organization responsible for the education and training and workforce design of the NHS workforce in England. Um, we're responsible in particular for the uh, planning and the education of doctors and dentists in training. We pay their salaries, and that's a big part of our work we do with our deaneries. But we're also responsible for oversight of the quality of the education processes in England, um, workforce planning, and also uh, more recently getting into looking at workforce transformation, workforce redesign, looking at the nature of the workforce we need um, for England uh, moving forward. Um, my role is responsible for looking at workforce transformation. It's also um, oversight of knowledge management, bringing evidence to the bedside through the NHS library service. Um, technology enhanced learning, how we use uh, blended learning, uh, e-learning and the like uh, for um, the workforce in training, both undergraduate and postgraduate um, uh, within England. Um, we've currently got a workforce crisis, people know that. Um, the workforce has changed massively even in the last six years. Uh, the current 40,000 nurse vacancies that we have uh, in the NHS is not just a result of uh, HEE didn't put any money in and we didn't train the nurses. Actually, the number of nurses training has actually gone up uh, since 2012. But actually, if the turnover rate of nurses had stayed uh, the same as it was in 2012, there'd be an extra 20,000 nurses in the system today. Uh, working. So something is changing and has changed quite rapidly in a short space of time. Part of it is the mid-staffs effect. Uh, the travesty there meant that actually the number of nurses put on rotors uh, changed quite markedly since 2012. But actually overall, the way people want to um, go into and work for the health service, um, how they want to work, the rotors they do, has all changed. People um, and millennials want to work differently, they want more flexibility. And that's something that we're trying to react to now in terms of how do we make the NHS a place that people want to work. And actually, if you look at the undergraduate pipeline, things are still looking very rosy with the exception of a couple of areas like podiatry and um, radiotherapy. Um, 
for, for radiographers. Actually, on the whole, most of the programs are still looking pretty healthy in terms of the number of applications that go through. And the two most popular is paramedics and physios, where there's something like a 10 to 1 ratio in the number of people uh, applying to go into that profession. So overall, things still actually look relatively good, but we have got to uh, react and we've got to change. William Gibson, the sci-fi writer, said in 2005, uh, the future is here, but it's very dispersed. And I think if you look at that and you look at what's happening in the NHS today, the future is here uh, for digital transformation and the use of digital technologies. The problem is it's in isolated pockets. And if the really good stuff that is happening in those isolated pockets was happening everywhere, the NHS would be a very different place uh, than it is in the current, uh, current place in England. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, digital transformation and the journey we've taken over the last 12 months in HEE um, in terms of where we're going with this. There we go. Um, autumn before last, uh, Jeremy Hunt was in San Diego and he met someone called Eric Topol. Um, Eric is the sort of Mahatma Gandhi of digital technologies. He's the uh, editor of the International Journal of uh, Digital Medicine. Um, he's got a massive following and he's a prolific writer in this area. And Jeremy asked uh, Eric whether he'd be willing to come and do a little review, as he called it, uh, of where we're at in England and where we might be going. Um, and these are the exam questions uh, that he set. He wanted us to look at um, what are the technical developments taking place across the world in digital technology and um, how is that going to affect and impact on the roles of uh, those working in the NHS today over the next two decades? What impact that would have on the skills we'd then require in the NHS a result of those changes? And then the big question is, what on earth do we need to do about the education and training pipeline? What do we need to do in terms of curricula uh, and looking at the existing staff, the 1.4 million people working in the NHS today, what do we need to do to them to support them on this journey? Um, Eric readily um, came to do that review. He was given free reign to invite the people he wanted around the table, which he did. He did it free of charge and the report was published in February. And what I'm going to do is take you through some of the highlights of that report and, and what it said. Eric, one of Eric's books is uh, The Patient Will See You Now. And I think one of the big pieces uh, that came from this review and uh, was a golden thread throughout is that we have to keep the patient at the center of what we do when we talk about digital technology. They have to be empowered and they have to understand uh, what their role is as part of this journey. Uh, and we were very clear of that. And again, having an American come over and look at our um, system, which um, we sometimes think is a, is a real challenge when we work in it and we, we know what the flaws are. Eric's observation from his work worldwide is we've probably got the greatest chance of making a difference quicker than any other country in the world. He was actually blown away by the fact that he was sitting with people um, from various backgrounds, various professions, education sector, uh, the health sector and, and industry, and everyone had the patient at the center of their conversation. And within the conversation, the patient was always brought back to in terms of what does it mean for them. He said you'd never get that where he works in Southern California. You'd never have, even though people that in a competitive system, they would never have that commonality. And he, he was quite blown away by the universality, which he'd heard about but had never appreciated how it actually worked when we all get together and sit about to, uh, around the table and talk about healthcare redesign and healthcare transformation. He also said, uh, and Tony's mentioned it, um, the UK is ahead of the game by far in terms of the science, in terms of genomics. But of course, uh, in true British style, we're not so good at then taking the entrepreneurial route and what are we gonna do with that 
uh, science and how are we going to turn it into something that makes a difference to us as the citizen and the consumer of, of healthcare. And of course, China and other countries are moving very rapidly in terms of how they're doing that. We need to be on top of that game. And at the moment, I think we're still there, we're still moving quickly, but we need to make sure uh, that that stays the case. The second piece is around evidence. We made sure that the report was evidence-based, not in terms of randomized control trials, but making sure that what we heard was right, was ethically right, and uh, was the direction of travel that we felt the health service could adopt. And through all of this, a big issue around is this technology going to lose, mean we're going to lose jobs? Does it mean that we're suddenly going to not have radiologists because the uh, AI technology is going to read the X-ray? That is not the case, and we were very clear up front that the report was not going to be saying that. It was around what can technology do to, t to take away mundane tasks away from the clinician to give the clinician more time to spend with the patient or to do things differently so they really optimized the clinical time that they had uh, rather than getting caught up um, in um, the, tech, the, the administrative functions that were taking place. And I, I know now you're all going to tell me, because this also came through during the review, we're nowhere near that. You know, we've got multiple sign-ons uh, at, at the ward station. Uh, we've got tech that doesn't talk to tech within a given organization. Uh, we've got different systems that are not connecting. And up front, we recognize the watcher report that came out only a few um, years ago there's a recognition that the big boxes do have to talk to each other to truly get interoperability and to really take advantage of some of the technologies that are there. But that doesn't prevent us from doing a number of things already to prepare the workforce for this digital technology coming through. And that's some of the stuff I'm going to take through, you through now. Ethics, uh, on, on the groups, we, we split the work uh, into four areas, uh, genomics, artificial intelligence and robotics, and digital medicine, and then we had a group looking at organizational development. Um, the organizational development group, hugely important, because actually when you look at this stuff, it's not about the tech. It's actually about hearts and minds. It's about understanding the context in which you are working with the other professions in the organization and how you bring about change and using tech as then the vehicle to, to bring about that change. And actually, of all of this report, I think our sense is 80% of this is hearts and minds and a willingness and an understanding to work with people in a very different way around that organizational development and organizational behavior that's required to bring about change. Why is it in the NHS, and Matt Hancock's famous um, statement is, the NHS has more pilots than British Airways. Uh, we're fantastic at taking money and doing pilots, but if it's working in Queen's Med in Nottingham, why is it not working in Leicester Royal? And we see this constantly. There's something around we are not good in the NHS at adoption and spread. And the organizational development group looked at what are the things that we need to unblock that? What are the things that we need to support uh, clinicians in terms of the time to spend time with uh, managers, nurses, other clinicians to think about what is it that we need to do to introduce this tech that actually then will drive something that gives us the gift of time back. Each of the groups has an educationalist, a patient representative, an ethicist, and a health economist. Health economists hugely important because these days, unless you can prove that the numbers stack up, you're not going to make the investment. Uh, and all the work that we did demonstrated the numbers stacked up. Um, the patient rep was fantastic because it kept us grounded. Um, they made sure in each of the groups that we really th saw this through the lens of the patient and the expectations of the patient. Um, and uh, the ethicist, hugely important, some really big eth ethical issues in all of this. Um, what do we do with the fact that we can now read the genome? And um, you can tell someone at the age of 18 that the chance of them getting cancer at 60-something is X percent. And then, of course, the issues around their family, et cetera, some really big and serious issues uh, around the ethics of that. The ethics of health inequalities, 
uh, those of us that have got iPhones and a tech, and to be fair, this country has got one of the highest penetrations of uh, uh, smartphone use uh, worldwide. Um, but actually, uh, for those that have got apps and are then doing all the healthy stuff, have got their Fitbits, we must make sure that the health inequalities and people that are from more deprived areas and have got social determinants of health that make a difference to their health care, what do we do to bring them on? And there's some really great work taking um, place with the widening participation program with, uh, in England to make sure that we reach those communities and understand what they need to take them on, those, uh, on this journey. And then also the ethics around understanding people don't just take AI and run with it without really understanding the algorithms within it. And there's some big issues around gender and ethnicity around how some of those algorithms work when you're looking at population health that we need to take into account. Genomics is a big issue. Um, I'm not going to go into the science here, but there is uh, clearly some issues around we've got to get some basics right in terms of undergraduate and postgraduate training and people understanding uh, genomics literacy, understanding what it is. Our sense from the work that we did was actually it's going to be predominantly in a very specialist area, but most clinicians will need to understand it so that they can do a translation to the patients um, with them. A lot of then the training will be to the specialists uh, in this area. And we're not talking about producing massive more numbers of people uh, around um, genetic counseling and stuff like that. We're, we're, we're sensing people will skill, will skill people to be able to do that genetic counseling. Uh, but one of the big issues within the genomics field will be the need for bioinformaticians. The volume of data that we'll need to work through and understand um, the bioinformatician will suddenly become a very important part of the clinical community. In terms of digital medicine, massive apps and everything else, wearables that are going on, um, yes, we can use them, yes, they are making a difference. People are already being prescribed apps that are making a big difference to the bottom line for CCGs. It's making it much easier for people to manage their own health care rather than having to trip up to the GP uh, and um, the outpatient clinic. And yes, online GP Skype and the like is going to come. My own GP, uh, I saw her the other day on the tube and she said in five years time, she thought 75% of all her consultations would pretty much be online. And actually, if you think about the flexibility that brings for, uh, particularly when you think about the feminization of the workforce, uh, we're suddenly bringing a whole bunch of people perhaps back into clinical care because actually can they, they can do clinical consults from home. And then artificial intelligence, massive area. It's a massive piece around uh, managing data, storing data, understanding data, and how that may be used. But already we're talking, um, there are trials um, taking place around pattern recognition in imaging, in breast screening in the East Midlands, a, a trial going on at the place. On the South Coast, I know pattern, pattern recognition is already in place looking at dermatology. So these things are already in place, but how do we understand the education and training journey for the clinician? And what do we need to put in the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, curricula to help people on this journey? As part of this work, um, and the Secretary of State slightly said we were overly conservative in what we'd done, um, I don't apologize for that because actually uh, we produced a report where all the Royal Colleges and all the regulators signed up for it. That is unusual in the education field for us to do that and have everybody signing up to it. Three colleges, the surgeons, the physicians, and the GPs have all appointed directors of innovation that are getting into this, um, this world. That shows the world has changed and is changing very rapidly, and a recognition that digital technologies are here and are making a difference. And Tony, you'll have to tell me when I'm um, out, of, out of time, because otherwise I'll carry on talking. About um, five minutes, Pat. This, um, can't see uh, fantastically as a slide, um, but actually we spent a hell of a lot of time. People love to get into the tech. They love to get into the conversation about which tech is going to take off first. Um, telemedicine's been around for a long while, but actually um, there's a reason why people aren't taking it up. It's um, clunky at times. Uh, it's only now that the new Skype technologies and other things are making people suddenly sign up for it. Right at the bottom of the list, writing the genome. It's incredibly specialist. It's already in place in the country. Um, 
the CART T um, work that's been commissioned by NHS England means that um, people are having their genome read. Um, it's been sent off to America to be uh, rewritten and being sent back and injected in and is um, bringing about treatments that we'd have never thought of a few years ago. Um, the arrows show when the impact to the workforce is really going to take a hold. And it gets, as it gets darker, it is showing a greater impact on the workforce. The reason why most things don't kick in until 2023 and after is, one, the workforce is still not really prepared for this, even though we're already here and it's already taking place. But also, there's a recognition of this whole piece around interoperability. And until the big boxes do talk to one another, we're not really going to be able to optimize where we want to go uh, with this agenda. But I think from a Health Education England point of view, we're saying we're here, we've got to prepare the workforce, and we've got to move forward. Uh, I'm conscious of time, and I will keep um, carry on talking, and that's the danger. But uh, just some examples. Simple case in Brighton. They decided to clear out their fracture clinic and do most of it online. That has made a big difference to patients that don't know, now need to clock up to the cattle market of the fracture clinic, and it means that the clinicians have got more time for those patients that do need to, um, do need to be there. Um, it makes a big difference, and I know a number of fracture clinics around the country are already now picking this up. If you look around the country and look at so we did some productivity work. Um, Jeremy Hunt was very uh, nifty when we left his office with Eric uh, when we first started this. And he said, oh, and by the way, Eric, will you do a bit of work on productivity and show some numbers? Um, so what we've done is taken small scale stuff that is working in the country and then scaled it up to say, if we did this everywhere and spread and adoption worked, and I'm being realistic, that I know that can't happen, there are some big numbers of productivity that would really make a difference to the bottom line and give the gift of time back. So fracture clinics, 142,000 hours back of clinical time um, if it was scaled up. Remote monitoring through a clinical hub using very basic um, uh, technologies and Skype, a 40% reduction in the number of people taken from care homes into the Airedale ED department. This project has now been um, a similar project in Tameside, is showing exactly the same results. Um, just using simple technology, if you think of what that would look like for if 40% of all our care home admissions across the country, that's producing you 218,000 hours of A&E consultation back into the system. Our A&E departments would look de very different as a result. Um, if you look at very simple speech recognition, project in Sunderland, ED department, save three minutes of time of every clinician by using very simple speech recognition. If we upscaled this to the whole of the NHS and people really got into simple speech recognition, um, and that's before you even start using AI behind it, some massive numbers. Look in primary care, just one minute alone of primary care time saved, and we all know how long it takes when a GP is writing and sitting, and you're sitting there while they're typing in the consultation room. If it was done by speech, and they talked to you uh, while they were making their note, that's 3,200 GPs time back. Um, the same for radiology, big time back. We've got a big step ahead. We've got 1.4 million staff to um, upskill to get this agenda out to. Uh, 20, um, in 20 years' time, 90% of all jobs will be impacted by digital skills. Uh, we've got new professional roles coming as a, a way of this, and now the way that we learn will be very different as a way of this. I'm going to skip through this, but the slide pack will be available. But I'll just finally say where we're at with this. Uh, our chair, Sir David Bean, led a piece of work picking up all the recommendations of the top all review and where we might go with it. And we looked at capacity, capability, and making sure we built the environment. And in effect, this is the next steps. Uh, all boards in England will be going through a boot camp, um, just bringing them aware of this agenda, what they need to do, and how they need to prepare themselves and their workforce for this agenda. We'll be bringing together the resources of existing material so people can use it and we don't reinvent the wheel. Um, and we'll be looking to uh, look at how we work with the universities to change curricula to make sure that the digital agenda is uh, both in the undergraduate and postgraduate curricula. And I said the Medical Schools Council is already on to this. Um, we'll be doing some workforce planning of what are the future roles that we require, particularly in the tech 
support by informaticians, data analysts, how many have we got now and how many will we need for the future. We'll be looking at how people can move into these careers for the future because we'll be needing many more of them to support the clinical workforce. We've released uh, top all fellowships, of which we had 250 applicants, which were absolutely amazing. We've appointed 15 to do projects in their own organizations just to get a taster of what this looks like. And we're going to be uh, rolling out um, a genomics education program to support the understanding of um, where we're going with genomics and what skills people require uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's a really great report. If you, it's available online if you want to download and read it. So what I'm going to do is go straight on, and I'm going to ask our clinical entrepreneurs to be right on time. Daffid, if you want to come up and try and shave it, catch us back up on time and shave a little bit off if you can. So you're going to hear five pitches now related to innovations from frontline clinicians in the health service, which are some of the things we're helping people support and develop. Daffid. Thanks, Tony, and it's great to be here this morning um, to give a little bit of flavor of the Clinical Entrepreneur Program and that, what that sort of meant for you know, my journey, really. So I wanted to give just a very quick uh, overview of, of a little bit about me. So I was a Welsh Urology trainee and sort of sidestepped a little bit in 2016 to do a Clinical Leadership Fellowship, um, and that was a, a, around the same time that I went through the Clinical Entrepreneur Pro Program. Before... Um, taking some work that I did during that year um, and went and joined the ever controversial uh, Babylon Health as an artificial intelligence clinician before at the tur turn of the year this, this year uh, running uh, our new startup called Concentric Health. So just a sort of some reflections from me about the clinical entrepreneur program. So the first thing to say is that um, the program took two individuals who were interested in the consent problem um, and really, Tony let, <laughs> made us do this, um, took two individuals and said, guys, you could do so much more as a team, and um, brought Ed and I, who are sort of up on, on the screen there, together, and the start of the foundations of, of a team that, could, that can do so much more. Um, and really, there's a big part around bridging that gap between being a clinician and being a, a clinical entrepreneur. Um, the business world brings a quite a different mindset, as well as a whole load of practicalities around actually what does running a business sort of mean. Um, and also the support to, to balance both those worlds. So although I'm currently uh, working on the business full time, Ed continues to be supported by the program to do four days a week in clinical practice and a day a week with us at Concentric. So very briefly about Concentric Health. So our vision is to positively transform the consent process for all, for clinicians, for patients, and for organizations. So our digital consent platform means that your consent process can become paperless, is easy, and secure. Um, and one of the things that we're looking to do is really support data-driven decisions. So using best available research um, and patient-reported outcomes to support those decisions and empower patients towards making shared decisions with their clinicians. So for the next 12 months, so we've been quite fortunate to be supported by a significant Innovate UK grant, which means that we can now to, uh, deliver an enterprise solution in consent uh, later this year. Uh, we've got a development and design team hired, and we've got a little office in, in Cardiff, and are collaboratively developing uh, our platform with three trusts and health boards ready for trust-wide deployments later this year. So some challenges very briefly. So I think there are challenges both um, from a personal perspective and system challenges. So one of the things that I've battled with personally over the last three years is this balance between developing clinically led products whilst maintaining clinical practice. And so I think it's quite interesting to reflect on how we're currently doing it between Ed and I, where we can drive the product clinically led with my involvement with the business, but, but keep Ed really involved in the business so that we're not risking getting too far away from the reality of, of the front line. Um, and certainly on a daily basis, um, there are new challenges um, in this sort of business world, so new, new rules of engagement. And certainly for me in the last few months, uh, you're stopping me? You, no, you can say your last words. Okay. Um, so last point for me 
is that I have no interest in developing something that is not useful to clinicians on the front line. Um, so I really am keen to partner with anyone who's interested in, uh, in joining us on our journey. So if you're interested in innovating the consent space, come and work with us. Go and have a seat. Who's next up? Is it next to the slides should come up? Is it you, Chetan? So, sir, I've cut your time to three minutes. You're going to have to get it in much quicker. So Chetan is a dentist who specializes in artificial intelligence and is going to tell you all about his MRI prostate program. Wow, how amazing is that? Yep, I think I'm uh, unique in working in the two most inhospitable areas. Um, Okay, so my name is Chetan Keha. Um, our project is in collaboration with the London Clinic, and our company is called Jiva.ai. Um, the project is called the ArtMac project, and it's using artificial intelligence to detect prostate cancer from MRI scans. Um, as recently as May, NICE has just said that MP multiparametric MRI should be the first line investigation for patients with suspected prostate cancer. Um, and what they found is by using this, we would save about 25,000 men from having biopsies. And apart from that, it also increased the number of uh, detections for clinically significant cancers as well. Uh, and of course, reduce the sort of expensive side effects that we have, uh, such as sepsis. Um, the, the only problem with this is that humans, we're not the greatest at looking and accurately diagnosing anything from x-rays, MRIs. Uh, generally, sensitivity specificity is in the range of about 65%. Uh, apart from that, we've got a huge backlog of scans within both, not just NHS actually, privately, you're talking about weeks to months. And the third factor, which I haven't listed, which is actually really important, we're losing about 23% of radiologists in the next three years due to retirement. So I'm gonna try and whiz this forward. So the project is with uh, the London Clinic, and what we've managed to get is a thousand uh, Tesla 3 MRIs. We call it a gold standard data set because you've got one radiologist and one pathologist that has confirmed the diagnosis. So in terms of a data set, it's as good as we can get. We've got the scans. Each scan has about 780 slices, and from that we've digitized it, and each, is given a, each pixel is given a demarcation, demarcation of zero to one, depending on the, uh, the blackness of the pixel. Um, this is then further broken down into lots of smaller arrays to look for sub-patterns. And again, at this sort of level, we're now going beyond what human eyes can actually see. So then what happens is when we run it through Jiva, um, it does a computation and it works out, is this a tumor or not? It then compares that to the label, was it cancerous or not? Once it's done that, once it's, and if it wasn't a cancer, it goes back, and it's called back re regression, to actually alter the complexities and the parameters to make it correct. So it sort of self-corrects. And the idea is that we do this iteratively until we get about 85% accuracy. So the good news is that we've now got proof of concept. So we've got a sensitivity of about 78% and specificity of about 87% in our small sample set. We haven't analyzed the whole thousand, but that importantly will get better. Um, I was gonna go talk about how much time I've got. No, you're out okay. of time, Any last closing words? So if anyone's interested in collaborations, we're hitting clinical trials next year. So if anyone's interested in helping us with that, we would love it. If anyone's just won the lottery, we need serious money. We'd like that as well. So please do give us a call. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Young Kyle, I think, is up next. Kyle. This is amazing. Come on, sir. Three minutes. I'm going to keep you to it. Off you go. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Kyle, proper medic, doing GP um, from Devon. Um, my story, effectively, we were on a ward round. We saw a baby with nappy rash. We didn't know what caused it. We found out it's a chemical burn from ammonia caused from the urease enzyme. Uh, with bacterial urease causes ammonia, you get a chemical burn. We somehow got a grant of about £125,000 to extract urease inhibitors from watercress because some historical literature suggested that watercress had urease inhibitors. The graph on the left shows that these were all in the hydrophilic end, so we made a press of watercress, a watercress extract, 
Uh, and the graph on the right shows that if you compare this against lithostat in the bottom left, some of you may know that from the States, acetohydroxamic acid, it's a biological standard urease inhibitor, we can block the ammonia production as well as the biological standard urease inhibitor. Uh, so where we are is we now have these urease inhibitors extracted from watercress, which can do all these clever things. So on the left is the urological uh, potential. So struvite, for example, urea going to ammonia in the uh, urinary system causes calcium and phosphate to come out of solution. Uh, it causes stones, struvite kidney stones, nappy rashes and ammoniacal chemical burn, block catheters and biofilms, all because of the ammonia production from these bugs, Proteus, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Staphylococcus. They are our urological potentials for this, uh, this extract. At the top, we've got agricultural potentials. So agrotain is something that farmers have been using for years. It increases the yield of their animal, of their animals, because instead of the urea going to ammonia, the urea gets recycled into useful amino acids that they can absorb, and they get higher yields from their animals. Transfer that into a gastroenterology setting, it can be used in frailty. People who are recovering from diseases, elderly people, could actually potentially recover quicker because we can make their gut more efficient at uh, absorbing protein. Hepatic encephalopathy, we're working with the Southwest liver team. Instead of you getting the buildup of uh, serum ammonia, crosses the blood-brain bar barrier and you get hepatic encephalopathy, you can metabolize the amino acids. People with liver cirrhosis tend to be frail anyway, you get a, a double dose of goodness. Spore supplement could be great. Helicobacter pylori in the gut, that has an extracellular urease enzyme, so it produces ammonia and buffers itself against the stomach acid with ammonia. That's how it survives in the stomach. If you block out urease, it can't survive. Where we are next, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Where we are now, we're going for an Innovate UK Smart Grant. Uh, on the 21st of July, we've got uh, the Southwest Liver Team who are backing us in trials. We've got animal trials at uh, Rothamsted's North White facility but we need to get some urologists on board to try and help us test these claims. That's me at the top. Please do get in touch. We're working with the biggest producer of watercress in the world, which is the watercress company, and Cress Protein and Cress Hay, I can tell you about another time. Good lad, well Cheers. done. So we've had a junior doctor, we've had an artificial intelligent machine learning dentist, uh, we've had a GP with an organic... Uh, compound um, uh, to help us solve nappy rash and other things, and now a consultant urologist to tell us about what he's been doing on the Entrepreneur Programme. Thank you. My name's Rick Popa. I'm a urologist at Guy's Hospital. It was a man like this that changed my life. He was a man whose joy in life was to climb mountains. I thought he had prostate cancer. I did prostate biopsies. He didn't have cancer, but he developed profound life-threatening sepsis. He ended up on dialysis, and he never climbed a mountain again in his life. I ruined his life. I changed my life. I started doing transperineal biopsies. We introduced this at Guy's in 2006. And over the last 12 years, transperineal biopsies have been embraced by the NHS. We recognized that because we wanted to see who should have a transperineal biopsy, that we would do a pre-biopsy MRI scan. And this has been incorporated by NHS England. And as you know, we have pre-biopsy MRI scan. And NICE have recommended that this has to be done on all patients. What's interesting is NICE also comments that 15,500 transperineal biopsies were done last year. That's 30% of all biopsies. 30% of all biopsies causes real problems with the diagnostic pathway. And in my own cancer network, in 2016, 30% of our breaches were because of diagnostic biopsy. It was a problem for which I thought there was no solution. Three years ago, I was introduced to the Precision Point Transperineal Access System. This allows me to do a, a cognitive targeted and systematic comprehensive transperineal biopsy through two single punctures under local anaesthetic in the outpatients. It has transformed our practice at Guy's. 90% of our biopsies are now done under pure local anaesthetic. 70% of the biopsies are done in the outpatients and 60% by a nurse practitioner. I was fortunate to be invited to apply for the Clinical Entrepreneur Programme by Tony. It gave me the opportunity to meet other entrepreneurs. 
I learned about the NHS Innovation Accelerator. I applied to become a fellow on the NHS Innovation Accelerator. This is a program that's supported by the AHSNs. This has given me insight into what makes the NHS work, how I could imagine scaling this device further. And it's this engagement that is allowing us to deliver what we call Trexit. In our cancer network, we no longer do any transfecal biopsies at all. We achieved Trexit on the 7th of March, way in advance of Brexit. How will we deliver an NHS Trexit? What about a UK Trexit? How is this going to be scaled? This is what I need help for, and this is what we will achieve, and Baz will help us do it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rhett. Very good. And we, we're using that now in South End. We've been really impressed with that, and we're driving that. And I demonstrated it on Breakfast TV not so long ago. Last up is someone who's not on the Entrepreneur Programme, but has applied to come and join it. And I said, come and tell us why you don't necessarily want to be an entrepreneur, but an intrapreneur. Learn that commercial skill, knowledge, and experience. So, Mark Lucky, we're in your hands. Hi, thanks, Tony. So my name is Mark Lucky. I'm a consultant urologist as well. Um, one of the reasons I am applying to join the program is I've always had an interest in innovation, but what is exciting, I mean, we've heard some great talks today, there is innovation, but my interest is what happens next? What happens when we do innovate, when we do find a product, how do we adopt it? How do we encourage uptake and spread? I was one of the early adopters of U the Eurolift procedure um, for, for lower urinary tract symptoms in men. And one of the things, although it is a proven system with good results and it's nice approved, rolling this out, and I am a mentor for it, has been incredibly challenging. So one of the reasons I'm joining the program is to learn the commercial skills, to learn the entrepreneurial skills in promoting other innovation throughout the NHS, which is ultimately what we need to do in order to provide the best possible patient care. Thank you. Brilliant. And Mark has caught us up on time wonderfully just at the end with a minute to go. So I'm afraid there aren't going to be time for questions, but I'm going to be around in uh, the hall in the area until about uh, uh, midday, and we're happy to be connected if you've got some other ones on email. It's a really exciting time at the moment, I think, in healthcare. Um, this is why I've stepped forward and taken on this new role as the Associate Medical Director for my SDP. I hope to become the first purely digital urologist in the country because I've decided we should actually trial just making it completely virtual and I'm going to step out of regular clinical practice for a year. Um, we've just won a national NHS England outpatient transformation grant to help us make that happen. So hopefully, maybe in a year's time, we can come back and tell you um, what the digital urologist of the future might look like. But if you're interested in joining in, come and see me. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>